our podcast is brought to you by We Push Back. In the last few years, a certain genre on social media has been plagued with informants who misrepresent the truth to benefit themselves. They've gone unchecked for far too long. This smoke and mirrors routine is what has plagued the criminal justice system, resulting in many wrongful convictions. We Push Back is about bringing attention to these informants who have little regard for the truth and offering a voice to all those impacted by their lies. This website will work as a united hub, bringing all related information to one portal. We Push Back. Welcome back to A View from Mulberry Street. I'm your host, Matthew J. Mary, and um, today we're going to bounce around on the lighter side of the view from Mulberry Street, because we can't always talk about blood and guts, uh, and I think that last week when we did our episode, Housekeeping, uh, I tried to, uh, to establish that what we're trying to do here at this point in time, you know, is to bring out a lot of serious issues that need to be exposed relating to the criminal justice system. But we also are interjecting parts of my life, you know, how I grew up on Mulberry Street, the Lower East Side, Knickerbocker Village, Xavier High School, the whole shebang of everything that went on during the years. And we try to interject some colorful people who uh, have been part not only of my legal career, but of my life. And uh, so I think that at this point, we are doing more than just providing you with some information that maybe you didn't have before. We're trying to have a little fun, a little entertainment. And I think that an important part of my life was... uh, not only meeting the people described by the government as gangsters. You know, I was at a wake not long ago, and my son overheard someone saying, you know, Matthew Mary knows every gangster that ever lived. Well, of course that's not true, because I was born in 1950. But I can say I've met a lot of people that, the government calls gangsters, and I love them, mostly all of them. <laughs> but uh, in addition to meeting gangsters during the, the course of my life, I've met a lot of interesting, legitimate guys. And I've promised you in the past that I would define for you what a legitimate guy is. And a legitimate guy is not what you think it is. You think a legitimate guy is someone who goes to work and doesn't commit crimes. Indeed, you'd be correct to assume at least that much. But in the world that I live in, a legitimate guy is anyone, anyone at all, who is not connected in any way to what the government calls organized crime. And so many people who have gotten in trouble in the street have been able to get away with whatever they did or to get out of trouble because they are legitimate guys. And legitimate guys don't get hurt. Legitimate guys who screw up in the street, get a chance, almost always. So being a legitimate guy, growing up on Mulberry Street or at Knickerbocker Village, you had a distinct advantage from the people who weren't legitimate guys. You could get away with a lot if you are a legitimate guy. Okay, what I want to talk about today is not just legitimate guys, but some famous guys. And someone asked me, well, what what do these people have to do with your podcast? You know, your podcast is about, you know, it's about knock around guys, street guys, and and, and, and the like. The, the, the reason it's connected is because most of the time when you meet famous people, it's because of who I am, because I'm Matthew Mary, the lawyer, the so-called mob lawyer. And, and that's how I got into 
a lot of different situations, which we talked about in the past, about being involved in, in the community mayors and many legal groups. Uh, you know, during the course of, of this uh, podcast, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the Al Smith dinner, uh, which was held very recently. Uh, and at the Al Smith dinner, I met all sorts of people. Uh, Rosanna Scotto was the uh, MC last night. I've met her a couple of times in my life. Uh, uh, Cardinal O'Connor. Well, I could do a whole episode on Cardinal John O'Connor. Uh, he was one of the most uh, uh, unforgettable people that I've ever met in my life. Uh, last week, I talked a little bit about Irish tough guys. I've never met an Irish tough guy tougher than John Cardinal O'Connor. And as I say, I might have to do a whole episode on him to do him justice. And I met him through the community mayors, and I met him through being president of the Catholic Lawyers. Uh, at the Al Smith dinner, I met Senator Al D'Amato, and I've got a few stories to tell about him. I met President Reagan. You know, I met President Reagan, and I had a, uh, I was on the, on the greeting line, and I had a big Reagan uh, for President Button. It's uh, supposed to be non-political. And I walked, I walked up to the president, and uh, he, he was a little bit hard of hearing. And his wife was standing right next to him, Nancy Reagan. And uh, I said to him, I said, President, Mr. President, I know this is a non-political function, but I just want to let you know. And I, I pulled open my jacket, and, and there's a huge Reagan button there. And all the, all the Secret Service agents were, were getting there. Oh, oh, what's going on? And, and uh, uh, Nancy Reagan uh, uh, started to laugh, and President Reagan started to laugh. And Matthew Mary did not get in trouble. Uh, a couple of years later at the Al Smith dinner, I met then President uh, George H.W. Bush, President 41, Bush 41, like Ronald Reagan, a, an extremely, a very, very tall man, very tall man, very aristocratic. And um, I, I stood up in front of him to shake his hand, and he kind of looked down upon me like I was some kind of an insect, and I think he whispered to someone next to him. I don't know what he said. I think it was something like, who is this guy? How did this little Italian guy get in here? But anyhow, I, I was I was able to meet President George H. W. Bush, and uh, had a few words with him at the Al Smith dinner. Uh, who else? Uh, FBI Director Louis Free. FBI Director Louis Free was a, was a fellow who I had known as an FBI agent. I knew Louis Free as a federal prosecutor. We had many cases against each other. I knew him when he was a district judge, and when I was the president of the Catholic Lawyers, we invited Louis Free to participate as the guest speaker at our, at our annual breakfast for the New York Archdiocese Catholic Lawyers. And he arrived there uh, with his wife and then four children, and uh, no guards. He wasn't appointed yet as the director of the FBI, and I brought him in to meet Cardinal O'Connor, and uh, during the course of his speech, Louis Free and I knew each other so well that Louis said to me, Matt, I would like you to keep an eye on my children, my four kids. They like to run around. And indeed, they did run around throughout uh, the speech. And uh, I could say, as Tommy Karate was my babysitter for my daughter, I was a babysitter for FBI Director Louis Free and his wife. I met him again at another function called the Colombian Lawyers Dinner. Also, that was at, uh, that was at the Waldorf Astoria. And uh, at that function, I met Louis Frey's father and his mother, who were very, very interesting people. He was, he was a kind of a great guy, a very worthy adversary. You know, we talk on this program uh, about like how bad government is and, and the Justice Department and the FBI and the U.S. attorneys. Louis Free is an example, an example of what integrity is. And boy, I was very privileged 
to have met him. And at that Al Smith dinner, I also met the likes of uh, Police Commissioner Bill Bratton, who also was the uh, the head of the police department in Los Angeles and in Boston. Uh, he served two terms as police commissioner in New York. Uh, I met Governor Hugh Carey. I met Governor Mario Cuomo at the Al Smith dinner. And, uh, you know, I got to the Al Smith dinner to Dominic Della Rocca. And Dominic Della Rocca was the head of the community mayors of New York State. I was the chairman of the board of directors of that organization. We helped handicapped kids. Uh, we would take them to various events, maybe 100,000 kids a year. And uh, as a result of being in the community mayors, I met a lot of people, like, like Donald Trump and uh, Senator Charles Schumer. When I was with the community mayors, we met a whole bunch of mayors, starting with Ed Koch. We went to his birthday party one time, David Dinkins and Abe Beam. And the, the, <coughs> my, my once arch enemy, Rudy Giuliani, who is, you know, not my idea of what a prosecutor should be. He's the opposite of Louis Free. But uh, he was a damn good mayor, and he was a good community mayor, too. He put in a lot of time with us, with the handicapped kids, and I can't take that away from him. You know, no matter what we can say bad about Rudy Giuliani, and there's plenty bad to say about Rudy Giuliani, uh, he was a good mayor of the city of New York, and he helped us with the handicapped children for uh, at least eight years during his uh, mayorality. So met plenty of people like that. Uh, I also at the at the Al Smith dinner met Al D'Amato, and uh, he was always fighting with the press and everyone else. Uh, I also met him at at one of my favorite restaurants, the Parkside Restaurant in Corona Queens, and uh, he was always there when he was a United States senator and after and. Uh, Al D'Amato had a lot of guts. I, I always appreciated him. You know, one time uh, he was on some TV show and he was talking about a certain tie that he had and that the owner of the restaurant had, had, uh, had given him the tie. And, and so the, the news reporter said, oh, did you know that so-and-so is associated with the uh, Caputzel uh, crime family? Al D'Amato said on TV, he says, I don't know anything about that. All I know is when I go to that restaurant, I get the best food that I've ever eaten, and I like everybody there. So Al was a guy who was crusty, and he had, he had, he had guts. He had, he had intestinal fortitude. And I was talking to Al D'Amato one day uh, at the bar in Parkside, and you know, I said, you know, how are you doing now? And he said, how am I doing? He says, I got to thank Chuck Schumer every day for defeating me for the U.S. Senate, because now... I'm a Washington lobbyist, and I am in the chips, and I'm living a happy, wonderful life. So, you know, God, God bless Al D'Amato. Um, you know, I could do, I could do a whole, a whole uh, episode on Rayo's restaurant, but uh, I don't know if I will. Uh, Rayo's restaurant, as everyone knows, is one of the most famous restaurants in the country. Uh, and I was privileged to be able to, to go there. I don't know. I, I, I can't even count the times that I've, that I've been in Rayo's restaurant. I remember uh, one time I was with a couple of, a couple of clients of mine, and uh, we were sitting at the big table. When you, when you come into Rayo's, it's a table for eight. And I was with two gentlemen uh, who had just gotten out of prison. And we were sitting at that table, and we weren't eating. We were just drinking. And Regis Philbin uh, and his wife and another uh, gentleman, I think, I think he was with Ron Lauder, a multimillionaire, they were sitting in one of those little tables for four. You know, they, they are crunched. They're eating like that. And so Regis Philbin walks up to me. I had also met him through the community maze. Regis Philbin walks up to me, and he says, you know, do you guys mind if I ask you a question? And I say, no, not at all. And he said, you know, I'm a pretty famous guy. I'm sitting with one of the richest men in the world, and here we are at Rayo's, and we're, we're crunched into that table for four. We could barely move, and you three guys, you're at this big table for eight, and, and you're not even eating, you're just drinking. You're like, who are you? 
And I said to, to Regis, you know what, Regis? All I can tell you is that I am a graduate of Xavier High School. And you are a dropout from Xavier High School. You got kicked out of Xavier High School. And I graduated and was a, uh, an officer at Xavier High School, ROTC. And Regis laughed like hell. And I explained to him that my two uh, colleagues at the table had just graduated from college and we were celebrating and uh you know Regis had had a big laugh out of that and, and at Rayo's you would always meet very interesting people at, at at the bar and one of the people who who became one of my good friends is a f- person by the name of Louis Inglisi uh who had a nickname and they called him Fat GG he did not mind that nickname he was a large man and he had he had gone to prison for many 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 years, uh, but every time I went into Rayos, Lewis would embrace me and take care of my bill and and you know just be a great friend. And you know one time I was in there and uh, and I was a cigar smoker. I, I would say like really. I had a problem smoking cigars. I would fight with little old ladies about cigars and whether I could smoke in a certain location. Those are in the days before cigars were banned. So there I was in Rayo's, and, and for some reason, we could not get a cigar to save our lives. We tried everything. We went out ourselves walking around. For some reason, everything was closed down. And, uh, and Lewis and Gleasy, you know, G.G., he had a big cigar, a giant cigar, in his uh, in his pocket, his breast pocket, and he said to me, he knew how crazy I was about cigars, and he said to me, if we don't get a cigar tonight, I promise you one thing, this cigar is yours, and you're gonna have it. And I said, no, 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 I would never take your last cigar. But all the while I was thinking, I hope he's gonna give it to me. I hope he'll give it to me. And he did. And, uh, you know, Rayo's is just a place where you, you bump in to so many people all the time. But the person that I loved in Rayo's the most was the famous bartender, Nicky the Vest. Nicky the Vest. There's a picture of him up on the screen. And I don't know his real last name, but his nickname was Nicky the Vest. And everybody knew Nicky the Vest, and I wasn't a regular customer at, at Rayo's, but no matter how long I had been absent, Nicky the Vest, as soon as I walked down the steps, he saw it making this, this martini, Grey Goose martini, straight up with olives, cold as can be. And I loved being there, and I loved being with Nicky the Vest. You know, during my life as a little kid, I spent a lot of time at the Copa Cabana before it closed down, and I, I could do a whole episode on all the people that I met at the Copa Cabana, including the the, uh, the famous owner Jules Podell, who is quite a character. But uh, that's for another time. I wanted today, I wanted today to focus on. Um, on some of the legitimate guys that I met in the world of baseball, because baseball, you know, is part of my life. It's, it's a very important part of my life. And uh, during the course of my life, I, I, I have met George Steinbrenner. Uh, I, at one time uh, in my life, I used to carry a, a camera around with me, and, and I, I had always... I was always taking photos of myself with famous people just in case I met them. My office was filled with photos on the wall of very famous people of the time. And so one day, coming out of the men's room at Fort Lauderdale Stadium, Fort Lauderdale Stadium uh, in, in, in Florida, the Yankee spring, home, uh, spring training home at that time, and I'm coming out of the bathroom, and George Steinbrenner is coming out of the executive offices, which are close to each other, and we actually bang into each other. And I say to, to George, oh, hi, George, I'm Matthew Mary. I said, I've been looking for you for a long time. He said, looking for me? For what? And I say to George, I've been looking for you 
because I need you to be involved with my organization, the community mayors. We help handicapped children. While I'm talking to George, my friend gets my camera and takes a, a picture of me and George Steinbrenner, which I treasured for so long that I've kept the, the a little photo of George Steinbrenner and I in my wallet. And uh, I was thrilled to meet George, and he did try to make some effort to help the community mayors. Uh, also, uh, when I was down in spring training uh, in Fort Lauderdale Stadium, one, one day after I was married, my wife is not a baseball fan, and so we were going to the game, and naturally I got there at 11 o'clock, and I was you know, wandering around, and my wife and I got lost in the bowels of the stadium. We were underground. We didn't know where we were. We were near the clubhouse, and as I'm... As I'm walking in these narrow corridors, again, I bang into Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra. And, uh, you know, one of my heroes. And uh, I say to Yogi, quite nonchalantly, Yogi, I'm lost. How do, how do I get out of here? I want to get to the field level. And Yogi said to me, I don't know how you can get to the seats. But if you walk this way and that way, you'll wind up on the field. And then we walked out onto the field and... Uh, and then took our place in the seats. And my wife said, well, who was that man? And I said, that's Yogi Berra, famous baseball player and the manager of the New York Yankees. And she said to me, oh, how do you know him so well? And I explained to my wife, when you're a baseball fan, you may never actually meet someone, but you feel that you know the players and, and, and the people that you grew up with uh, as your stars. And so uh, I talked to Yogi like, like he was my best friend. And uh, I was happy to be able to, to bunk into him. On another occasion, down in spring training, uh, I was in Sarasota, Florida. I was with my friend. I think I was with Joe Bruno. And, and I went to get a hot dog, and I, I see Reggie Jackson walking around the stands. He was, he was retired by then. And there was some redneck guy who kept following Reggie. He was uh, harassing Reggie, and Reggie was trying to get away from him, and Reggie was going to the left. He was going to the right, and this guy kept following him and demanding, you sign this hat and so on, and Reggie didn't want to sign the hat, and, and the guy was getting tough with him. And as I say, you know, when you grow up a Yankee fan, <laughs> I'm a Yankee fan, uh, these people are like your relatives. You don't really know them, but you think you know them. So I stepped in between Reggie and this crazy guy. And I said to the guy, you know, hey, take it easy. You don't leave Reggie alone. Reggie took that opportunity to kind of scoot off. And I think he went into the elevator in the Sarasota ballpark and up to the executive offices and, and then see him again. And there I was, stuck with this crazy guy. And, uh, you know, nothing bad happened to me. But I was able, in my mind, to save Reggie Jackson. Okay, so uh, later in the game, I see Reggie and think he might recognize me, and I wave to Reggie. Hi, Reggie, remember me? And Reggie just looks at me like I'm like a piece of wood. Okay, I meet Reggie many years later at the Joe DiMaggio dinner. The Joe DiMaggio dinner at that time was uh, was sponsored by my friend Dr. Rock Positano, the famous, the famous foot doctor. Dr. Rock Positano not only handled Joe DiMaggio as his patient, but Dr. Rock Positano handled Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, Pavarotti, and many, many other world famous uh, uh, celebrities. And so, um, I go to this dinner, this Joe DiMaggio dinner, because it was also at Severian High School, which is not Xavier High School. Severian High School is in Brooklyn on Shore Road, and that's where my son went to school. And so it was a very expensive dinner, and we were there. And while I'm there, who do we see? Reggie Jackson! And Reggie Jackson... <laughs> Is signing autographs to everyone, shaking hands with everyone, taking pictures with everyone. And finally, you know, they cut everything off. And, and, and a friend of mine named Big Donnie, Big Donnie said, Matt, you didn't get to meet Reggie? I said, no. And they bring me over to Reggie after everyone 
had stopped, you know, after he had stopped taking photos, they take a photo of me and Reggie. I'm shaking hands with Reggie, and I say to Reggie, Reggie, do you remember me? I'm the guy from Sarasota, Florida, that I saved your neck when that guy was harassing you. And he says, who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, Reggie, and I'm holding his hand. He's trying to get away from me, but Matthew Mary is holding his hand so tightly. And I said, Reggie, don't you remember me? And don't you remember I saved you? And Reggie, Reggie screams out. He says, who the hell is this guy? And he asks me, turns to me, and says, are you Edward G. Robinson? That was pretty funny for me. So finally, I, I let his hand go, and Reggie kind of walked away looking at me like I was a crazy man, okay? Uh, who else have I met? Baseball. Let's just stick to baseball for a couple of minutes. One day, a, a guy from there, this all mixes in with the, you know, Matthew Mary, criminal defense lawyer. One day, a guy from Arizona, from Tucson, Arizona, known to me only as Joe from Arizona. Joe from Arizona comes to New York, and he's got tickets for a Yankee game. But not just tickets. He's got, he was a, a personal friend of the famous baseball pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, Herb Score, who was famous for having been hit in the head between the eyes by Yankee Gil McDougal. It, it kind of ruined his career, but Herb Score had a second career as the Cleveland Indians announcer. And we, me and my friends, and Joe from Arizona, we actually are in the, the, the press box, the broadcast booth of the Cleveland Indians. And as the game is progressing, at that time, my idol, number one, Billy Martin, was the announcer for the New York Yankees. And Billy is in the press box right next to us. And I say to Herb Score, I said, Herb, can you, can you introduce me to Billy, please? You know, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a camera with me. I would love to have my picture with Billy Martin and put that on my wall. And Billy came over during the break into our broadcast booth, and he was smoking a Tipperillo. And we, myself and my friends, Joe from Arizona and Herb Score, we had these giant cigars. They were a foot long, and they were big and thick, and we were smoking them. In those days, you're allowed to smoke at Yankee Stadium. And so I'm smoking this huge cigar, and I pull one out of my pocket, and I, I offer it to Billy Martin. And I said, Billy, why are you smoking that little chunky uh, Tipperillo, why don't you have one of these? And he just kind of laughed and shook me off. And he said, no, no. He said, I can never smoke a cigar like that. He said, I only smoke these things because I'm trying to stop smoking cigarettes. And so I pulled Bill Billy close to me and I said to him, at that time, Lou Pinella was the manager of the Yankees. And I think Lou had replaced Billy. Later on, Billy replaced Lou. And I said to to Billy Martin, I said, Billy, if you light up this huge cigar, I said, by the time you're finished smoking that cigar, I'll bet that you'll be manager of the Yankees again. And Billy Martin fell over laughing. We invited uh, Billy to, uh, to, come, uh, to come out with us that night. <laughs> and he refused, but Herb Score didn't. And Herb Score stood with us all night. We ran all around Manhattan. And Herb said during the course of that evening, I don't think I've ever been this drunk. And so we had a great, great time uh, with Herb Score. Uh, another guy that I met, another Yankee, Joe Pepitone. I think I told you that when I was in Rails one night, I was dressed like a Yankee. I came from the Yankee game. And I was standing at the bar. just happened, Joe Pepitone, was next to me in rails. He's a very tall guy also. And he turned to me and then looked down upon me. And he said, uh, and he saw me, you know, I'm a grown man. I'm dressed like a Yankee, like I have a Yankee uniform on. And he looks down upon me and he says, oh, he says, uh, nice to meet you. He said, you must be new on the team. Nice. Those are some of the stories that, that, uh, that I want to tell you. But, I think there's some other ones that deserve a separate episode. So we're going to break right now on this episode. And we're going to say for today, that is a view 
from Mulberry Street.